Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marenzi First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marenzi AG or Marenzi First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. <music> Some people, like when they pray, they get nervous and they say just too much. You know, when you pray in a small group, it's like, Lord, I just want to just, we just, we just come to just in spirit. Just, we just, just in justliness and justification. And just, we say just, and we just, and you're like, just finish the prayer. You're just not ready for this. Start stacking chairs. Come back next week and try again. My dad does this when he prays. He uses father way too much when he prays. Father, we come to your father and it's fair to father. Father, you are father. We come to your father. Father, just, just, father, father, just, 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 father, father. You don't talk to your friends like that. Ed, Ed, come over, Ed, 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 Ed. You are Ed, 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 Ed. Ooh, Ed, 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 Ed. He wouldn't be your friend anymore if you did that. Like he keeps saying, Ed, my name's Joe. best though is the way people where they pray over food that's the funniest <laughs> where we pray over food we don't know why we say you ever heard this one Lord bless this food and the hands that prepared it <laughs> the hands that prepared it <laughs> why not the whole body <laughs> no just the hands Jurassic Park. <laughs> Best, I love this one over food. Sometimes we pray over food and ask God to make up for our bad choices when we eat. That's funny. <laughs> no matter what it is, Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Lord, bless this bag of Cheetos. And this Jumbo Dr. Pepper Lord <laughs> somehow make this nourish us in some way. I don't know how you're going to do it, Father, but we just trust in you now. Father, change the molecular structure of this food. This complete trash we're about to shove in our gullet. Change the Cheeto into a carrot stick on the way down. Spirit of low carb, rain down on me now! I pray a hedge of protection around my pancreas, Lord! Right now! Intervene! The worst prayers, they gotta be the prayers that parents pray with their kids. No wonder they don't want to go to bed at night. My parents used to pray this with me in the dark when I was a kid. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to give. <laughs> if I should die. Before I wake, I pray the Lord, my soul. Sweet dreams. <laughs> See you in the morning. Maybe. I don't know. 50 50. I can't guarantee anything. <laughs> Oh, and don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> Psycho. Well, we are in our 
our second part of the Unanswered series. Last week we began a new series called Unanswered where we discussed God's desire not only to meet our needs but our wants and our desires. And yet most of us can relate with the frustration of praying prayers and not getting them answered. So we begin to answer the question, you know, why aren't they being answered? What am I doing wrong? What, what is it about? Is there something I can do to make it better? So today we're going to tackle the next hindrance for us when it comes to getting our prayers answered. So I want you to turn with me to Philippians 4. Today we're talking about the weeds in the garden. The weeds of doubt. If you're a VeggieTales fan, you know exactly where that came from. Philippians 4, verse number 6. Hallelujah. All right. If you have it, let's say amen. Here we go. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Shall we pray? Lord, we ask your blessing upon your word today like never before. Holy Spirit, help us to learn how to seek you better. Lord, help us to learn how to trust in you. Lord, each and every one of us desires to meet with you. And Lord, it's your desire to meet with us. So Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit will rise up. And Lord, help us to hear your voice loud and clear. In your precious holy name, Lord, I pray that I will preach as one who has authority with the demonstration of power. Let your sons and wonders follow us all the days of our lives. In your precious holy name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're, we're carrying on with our second part of this series about unanswered. But here's the thing. Most people believe that God can do anything. Right? Most people believe that. So here's the question that you and I tend to ask and tend to think about. Okay, if God can do anything, will he then do it for me? If God can do anything, but will God do it for me? Will God answer my prayers? Will God hear me when I pray? Will God Love me enough. All the other stuff. You can throw in a lot of different scenarios there. Am I good enough to get my prayers heard? Have I done the right things? Have I prayed correctly? You know, has my hair parted to the right side? I don't know. A lot of things you can ask at that time. And we ask, you know, do I deserve to have my prayers answered? What am I doing? That hinders my prayers from being answered. But here I'm here to tell you, sometimes it's a very simple answer. And it's this, I doubted. Doubt. I doubted. I doubted that God cared enough to answer my prayers. I doubted that God loved me enough. I doubted that he would. You know, here's something that I struggled with a lot of times, and maybe you have or maybe you haven't, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I've struggled with this. You know, I may have a headache and need a little money to pay a bill, and there are people dying of starvation somewhere, and I'm wondering, okay, God, is my prayer, it's big to me, but is it worthy enough for you? You know, when there are people dying of starvation and there are people that are hurting, you wonder, okay, Lord, is there enough for me? Is there enough to go around? Do I even have the right to ask of you, Lord? Have you ever just felt sheepish asking God for something because you know that there are so many other people hurting so much worse than you? You guys are awful quiet. I believe that there's a lot of us in this room that know exactly what I'm talking about. We're like, okay, Lord, 
Uh, I have this need. It, it doesn't even register on the rector scale, but it's big to me. I know that you have a lot up there that you're thinking about, you know, like a war in Ukraine or something. But on the other turn, God, you know, amazingly, we wonder, you know, what right do I have? But here's the deal. Amazingly, I have every right that God is just as concerned about my headache as he is about somebody with cancer. And, you, and before you shake in your chair and get all upset, we need to stop throwing our problems and our lack of resources and our lack of abilities on an infinite, all-powerful God. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Let me say it this way. We've got to stop limiting God. God does not have limited resources. God's provisions for healing is sufficient for the headache as well as those suffering from cancer or anything else. Nothing is limiting to God. God cares just as much about the little problems as the big problems because no problem is too big for God. Amen. So here's the deal. Your answers, my answers, your healings, my healings, your problems, my problems all need the same thing. A word from God. That's it. It has nothing to do with whether or not I'm more worthy or more worthy or more worthy than you. It has nothing to do with how big my problems actually are. What it has to deal with is am I a child of God? And if I'm a child of God, I have the privilege of being his child. And when I'm his child, he takes care of me. It really doesn't matter. You see, I sit here and think, oh, wait a minute, my problem's not there. You know, you know. Well, what I'm really saying is, is in my mind, my lack of resources and my lack of everything just places itself upon God. Well, if I can't do everything and I don't have the resources to meet every need, how can he? But here's the deal. God can meet an answer here in the United States at the exact same time in China. It's amazing. You see, God can heal my headache and cure cancer at the exact same time. You know, it, it may not be that you want to bother God, but here's the deal. We can't throw our hang-ups and our problems and our human reasoning and our lack of resources. It really has no bearing on an almighty God. None whatsoever. Jesus said it best like this in Matthew 10, 28. And I'm going to read it to you. This is what he said. He said, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. In today's money, it'd be one, two pennies. What is the price of a sparrow? What two pennies? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And if their hairs on your head are numbered, so don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. God's eyes are on the sparrow and God's eyes are on you. Basically, in layman's terms, he was saying this. Look, a sparrow is worth two pennies and God cares when they hit the ground. If God is so interested in a two-penny sparrow, how much more do you think he's interested in you? He's even numbered the hairs on your head, and yet you think you're not valuable enough to ask him. If his eyes are on the sparrow, his eyes are on me. It's an amazing thing. The same God that sees the sparrow sees me. The same God that is worried about the war in Ukraine is worried about my headache. The same God. Why? Because there's no lack of resources. There's no lack of power. There's no limit. And God never gives out. He never exhausts his resources. 
So today we're going to look at the third reason our prayers go unanswered. And I'm here to tell you, look, it's not an exhaustive list. Nor am I saying it's your problem. Just, you know, this week we're talking about doubt. Last week we talked about sin and disobedience. I'm not saying that your prayers aren't being answered because you doubt or because you have sin in your life. What I'm saying is, is these are valid options that you need to examine yourself over because it could be part of it. You have to decide for yourself which is which. I'm just saying, hey, wait a minute. We're talking about the 10 top reasons that our prayers aren't answered. And number three is our lack of faith. And I don't mean lack of faith in the way that you think I mean lack of faith. I'm not saying I don't trust God. What I'm saying is, is we doubt along the way. We don't take him at his word. We don't trust that he says and will do what he says. And then we also have a, this problem with believing and putting our own, we personify ourselves on God. So let's jump into this. Number one, that's a perfect segue. Number one, he's not you. Thank God. God's not you. Don't limit him. Look, God loves you because you're his creation. But when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you get the privilege of becoming his child. So you're not only his creation, but you're his child. And God takes care of you because you're his child. And I'm here to tell you, God loves you because you're his child. God takes care of you because you're his child with God. So you can ask the question, will God do it for me? Absolutely will. Why? Because there's no problem too big or too small for God. I love this quote I came across this week by Tori Ten Boone, and I want to read it to you. It says this, Any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. Man, that will preach. Everybody's talking about a tattoo. That needs to be a tattoo. <laughs> Listen, let me read that again. She said, Any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden amen to that you see when you think otherwise you're limiting god to human abilities and with a human mind god has the ability to heal here to touch over there you know, he has the ability to heal your headache, to provide for a child in China, and to move in Africa all at the exact same time. And he's not limited by any of the means in the between. You see, you cannot exhaust God's resources. That's why it's necessary to believe when we pray that God will do what we're praying about. We must have faith to believe that God will do what we're praying about. We have to hold out faith. We've got to hold out hope. we got to trust that God will do what he said he will do. And we can't sit here and say, okay, wait a minute. Your mind, God, must be somewhere else because I don't rank on your scale because we do. We also can't sit here and say my problem's too big because nothing is. And we can't sit here and say nothing's too small because nothing is. What we need to start saying is, hey, wait a minute. I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, I have the privilege of being his child. And as the child of God, I can have God on my side. Amen. I'm a pretty easygoing person, but you want to fight? Mess with my children. Amen. Amen. You want to fight? Mess with my kids. You want to see me angry? Mess with my children. You want to see my father angry? Mess with his kids.
We have to start believing, hey, wait a minute, it has nothing to do with my actual problem. What it has to do with is that I have a relationship with the king of glory. It's not a matter of my illness or my sickness. It's not a matter of my money problems or my health problems or this problem. What it has to do with is I'm a child of the king. I'm not him and he's not me. He's God and I'm not. He's not limited. It's an amazing thought. When we think about it, but we have to go back to trusting in him and taking him at his word. See, if you're praying for something, you have to start believing it. Just like if you're praying for someone else, you have to start believing that God will actually answer those prayers. If you're praying for your children, you have to start believing that God will answer those prayers. You know, some of us get messed up or like, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if I can pray for them. They don't believe. Well, it has nothing to do with them believing. Do you believe? You don't believe me? Well, look at it all through scripture. Think about Lazarus in the grave. Think about the man that was sitting in the window as Paul was preaching all night. And he falls down dead and Paul goes out and raises him. Listen, a dead man don't believe. But the faith of a father and the faith of a mother and the faith of a grandfather and the faith of a grandmother and the faith of a brother and a sister and a husband and a wife that stands up and proclaims we're children of God and we're covering our family with prayer and I believe that God will do what he said he will do. He's going to hold on. When I pray, I possess faith. God will hold my family. See, we don't just pray over our kids because we're trained to. We pray because we expect something to happen. We pray because we expect God to protect them, watch over them, heal them, do whatever we need in their lives. That's why we pray. It's trusting. Number two, it is God's will to heal. Listen, it's God's will to heal people. Now, how that manifests is different at different times. Some people are healed instantly. Whammo, they're healed. Some people are healed progressively. God has a plan. It doesn't happen instantly. And some people, they hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. God heals But whether it's instantly, whether it's progressive, or whether God decides to take us home, however you slice it, God's will is still to heal. God's will is still to move and to touch. So when we pray for somebody, we have to be very careful how we pray for them. Because I I, listen, I, I hear people say sometimes, and I've said myself, I'm guilty of this sometimes, you know, we, we start praying for somebody and we start, okay, Lord, if it be thou will to do this. And sometimes we do that because we're trying to give ourselves an out if God doesn't do it. Have you ever prayed for somebody and you try to give yourself an escape route just in case it didn't work? But the bottom line is, is I don't need an escape route. I don't need to make excuses. I'm not the healer. He is. I just pray. But it is my job to pray with faith because sometimes we send up prayers and we sabotage ourselves. We might give ourselves an escape route, but we also hinder our prayers because instead of praying in faith, we're like, oh, Lord, if it's your will. Well, it is. God's will is to heal. Now, sometimes it's instant, sometimes it's progressive, sometimes he takes us home, but it is his will. The Bible's clear about that. If you look at Isaiah 53, 5, it was a prophecy given, and it's an awesome prophecy. This is what it says. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes we were what? Healed. And then the fulfillment of that prophecy came in 1 Peter 2.24. And this is what it says. He personally carried our sins in his body. 
on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, we then were made whole. We were healed. You see, our healing has already been purchased by the stripes Jesus took on his back. My healing has already been purchased. Now look, we see Jesus healing people. We see the disciples healing people all the time. But then there came this time where Jesus went to his own hometown and, and they looked at him as Mary and Joseph's little boy. And what happened was, is the Bible says he didn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith, their lack of trust. They didn't believe in him. They saw him as Mary and Joseph's little one, not the king of glory. Now, did their lack of faith stop or hinder Jesus from healing? No, it didn't. But it hindered them from taking their need to him. It hindered them from trusting that he would do it. It hindered them from believing. You see, let's be honest. One of the reasons we do not see a lot of miracles is because we either don't expect to or we don't trust enough. We either don't ask or we don't ask with a lot of doubt. And I see this all the time. We either don't pray about the issue or when we do pray about it, we don't really believe it's going to happen anyway. It's just one of those shout outs. Again, we either don't ask or we don't believe it. Look, I, let me go back to what I said at the very beginning and let me emphasize that I'm not saying that if you're praying for a healing that you're not healed because you have doubt, neither more than I was saying that your prayers weren't answered last week because you're a major sinner. What I'm saying is, is before you start saying God's not listening or something's not working, start examining yourself because it could be. One of the major hindrances to our prayer is our lack of belief, expectation, and trust. We either don't ask or don't believe what we do ask. I'm simply touching on another issue that hinders our prayers. You do the application of it. But we have to listen to it. Number three, don't doubt doubt. <laughs> don't doubt doubt. Listen, don't say that doubt can't happen to you. Don't believe that you could ever grow enough that you don't have to deal with doubt. Doubt happens. It's a part of life. One of my favorite stories in scripture, I, I love it. This father is asking for healing for his son. And he says, Jesus, help me if you can. And Jesus responds, if I can, what? If I can, Nothing's impossible for those that believe. And then the father makes this awesome statement. It's one of the best statements in scripture. He says, okay, I believe, but you've got to help my unbelief here. That's the answer. Look, wait a minute. Look, I'm doing the very best. I'm believing, but God, I'm crying out to you. You've got to help where I lack. You've got to get me through this. Because look, doubt is a part of life and and we're all going to doubt at some point or another. But we don't just accept and say, oh, well, who cares? I doubt now. We say, oh, God, I'm having some trouble here and I need some help. Because I want to take you at your word. Because I believe you're the answer. You're the healer. You're whoever I'm praying you are. You're my provider. Everything. It's amazing. You know, and Jesus doesn't... Ask if it's God's will or he doesn't do all the other stuff. He just says the word and the son is set free and it's an amazing story. But it's an amazing story for us to learn. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe you and I need to first examine ourselves and then we say, Lord, help me where I fail. Because none of us will be perfect along the way. You say, well, how do I grow in my faith? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans that faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word. What does that mean? That means the more I study God's word and the more I put it into practice, the more faith I build. 
It also means that the people I hang around with, if they're speaking faith and life, my faith is grown. If I'm hanging around with people that speak in negative and death over me, my faith decreases. That's why our church attendance matters, because this is a faith-building exercise. It matters. I'm glad you're here because what we do matters. You know, the more you read and put it into practice, the better it is. It's also why we don't forsake the gathering together because faith grows as we study. And then finally, and I, I want you to, hopefully you're taking notes, what do you expect Faith is nothing more than expectation. It's staying focused on Jesus. You know, a perfect example of that, and most of us know the story of Peter walking on the water when he stayed focused with Jesus. He walked over the waves. He walked over the storm. He conquered what the enemy was throwing at him. And as soon as he turned his eyes off of Jesus and got him on his problems, got him on his fear and his worry and his doubt, what happened? He began to sink. Why? Because he lost connection with the Father. He kept his eyes off of it. He began to doubt. And church, I'm here to tell you, as long as we keep our eyes on the prize, which is Jesus, and we keep our eyes on him, God will always get us through whatever storm we're dealing with. He's faithful. He is faithful to us. Why? Because I'm a child of God. And I don't say that arrogantly. I don't say that because I want you to pat me on my back. I don't say that because I need a cookie. I say it because it's fact. I am a child of God. And we need to start believing it and taking it at face value. When the devil comes against me, he doesn't come against me because I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. And I belong to someone that's bigger than anything. The devil doesn't come against me. He comes against my father. David said, man, you come against me with your sword and your spear and your javelin. I come against you with the name of the father, name of God almighty, the name of who I belong to. You put whatever you want in there. And then he says, I'm going to cut your head off, dude. Because I know in whom I believe. It's an expectation of faith. One of the greatest hindrances to our prayers is lack of trusting, lack of asking. And then when we ask, we don't trust. And then when we do trust, we only trust for a limited time because answers don't always come instantly. I'm here to tell you that God is always on time, but never instant time. I heard a preacher say one time, God doesn't own a watch. I believe that. God doesn't own a watch. He really doesn't know when it's past half past my freak out time. But he's always on time. He knows. See, it's that trust that we talked about last week. It's eating that bland food. It's trusting that the one whom we're asking actually knows what we need more than we know. He knows not only my needs, but he knows my future so I can rest. Look, that's why I say all the time, you're a child of God. You're in the palm of his hand. I'm glad that I'm a child of God. I don't want to fix my own problems because I don't know tomorrow, but I know who's already there. If we learn how to trust in who he is, we say, okay, Lord, you've got this. You and I are fretting about something we can't change anyway. Not only are we fretting about something we can't change, but we're fretting about something that may not even happen. Have you ever been afraid about a meeting or afraid about something and then you got there and it wasn't what you thought? Man, oh man, we can make some bad stuff happen, can't we? I have a good imagination, man, oh man. But I'm a child of God. 
And it changes everything. It changes how I respond. It changes how I pray. Because I don't pray as a stranger asking a stranger. I ask, I pray as someone who asks my father. And then I trust. Jesus said, hey, wait a minute, parents. Parents, if you who are evil know how to give your child a good gift. Look, if they come and ask you for bread, are you going to give them a snake? He said, hey, wait a minute, if your child comes and asks you for a drink of water, are you going to give him a scorpion? No. Well, how much more then would your father, which is in heaven, who is all and above all and who loves you most of all, know how to give you good gifts when you ask? It's how we approach. Look, when my children come and they approach me, there's a way to move daddy and there's a way to irritate daddy. Right? <laughs> right. And we're not going to discuss that. One of them is sitting right here. But you get the point. <laughs> there's a way to melt daddy and there's a way to irritate. How we approach. That we approach not only with boldness, but we approach as approaching our father but we have expectation we believe we go in without doubt we know that god cares about our big and our little we know not only does he care but he wants to meet us why because he delights in us being happy he delights in the joy that we have god not only wants to provide my needs but he also wants me happy now does that mean that i'm going to drive around in a royce royce or whatever Oh, my Lord, that stir didn't come out right, did it? You know why? Because when I was in the middle of that statement, I immediately jumped to how high gas prices were right now. And I was like, how can I walk this back? God right now is up in heaven saying, you need an all-electric pedal car. I'll tell you what, they've taken the joy out of going to the gas pumps. I, I don't believe you used to put $30 in the car and you, you got to know your car intimately. You emptied out the trash. You wiped down the dash. You know, you cleaned it out. You know, a man's man, it's awesome. Now you put $30 in the car, you turn around and it clicks. You know, they've taken away my bonding time. It's amazing though that God looks at us as his child. And as a child, I approach my father and I believe and I trust that he not only wants to provide, he delights in providing. He delights in seeing me happy. So I don't approach him with this fear and anxiety of like, I, I don't know how to even ask you this. I don't, I don't know how to ask you. Well, look, I'm his child and I can't say anything dumb because he knows it already anyway. He's already seen me at my lowest. He's seen me at my best. He's seen me all the way through. He knows I'm dumb. I don't have to worry about providing it. I just come in as a child. Hey, wait a minute. It's the dumb one again, but I need help. And it's okay. I'm the child. But I know that he loves me and protects me and wants to provide for me. So I come in with expectation of it. I, I take him at his word. I do not not ask because I'm afraid that it's not important. And I do not ask because I don't want to bother him. But I'm also totally convinced that when I do ask, he cares. So I take him at his word. I don't doubt doubt. I have expectation of it. I don't limit God because of my limitations. I don't limit God because of my fear. I don't limit God because I don't have the resources. He's God. I'm not. I'm a possession. And I'm glad to be owned by the one who loves me more than life itself. And I can say that because he gave his life to prove it. I am owned by someone who loves me so much that he was willing to die for me. So when I approach him, I approach him as one who loved me enough to die for me, that cares for me because I'm his child. 
And I believe it with expectation. I was asked earlier, hey, wait a minute, do, do we keep bombarding God with the same prayer over and over and over again? Well, listen, a lot of it goes back to attitude and intentions. Think about it in your family. If you're worried about something, what do you do? You talk about it with your spouse. You talk about it with whoever. That's what's on your mind. That's fine. That's what you're supposed to do. Go to God and talk about it. You go to God and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm dealing with this. But then on the other side is if you're going to God be all the time because you didn't really believe the last prayer and you're all living in worry, you're all doubting, you're just, you know, you're just bombarding whatever, that's a little different story. But what if I keep coming to my father because, God, I, I'm worried here, and you're my comfort zone. God is moved, and he reaches down because he wants to protect me. So, yes, there are times that I bombard heaven because there are times that I need my father. There are times that I need him. I need his love. I need his touch. I need his presence. I need him. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to get myself to the place where I can meet with him. I need him. But I don't keep bombarding him because I'm trying to manipulate him or I'm trying to all the other stuff. I meet with him because we're in a relationship and he loves me. And I know that he cares about what I need. It's what I expect. It's the weeds in the garden. She said, hey, wait a minute. If you know how to give good things, how much more will your father in heaven? I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Look, this is a touchy subject, and I know that because all of us understand the importance of prayer we understand the importance of having needs met by god we understand that we are lacking all things we are lacking resources we are lacking abilities and sometimes we need a dire intervention but at the same time, you and I also understand the frustration of praying about an issue and not seeing it come to be, not seeing God move. And we ask ourselves, okay, what could that be? And I'm here to tell you today is another reason. It could be that we're either not asking or when we do ask, we're not believing what we're asking. I'm not here to say you're never going to have doubt. What I'm here to say is if you have doubt, deal with it. Jesus didn't rebuke the father for saying, help my unbelief. He was moved. And what did he do? He instantly took care of the problem. He's like, he got it. I'm not here to say you're never going to have doubt. What I'm here to say is don't live in it. Don't dwell on it and fix it. Do away with it. Because sometimes you and I, actually most of the time, you and I are the greatest hindrances to our own prayers. Whether we're living like we talked about last week with sin in our life or in some kind of disobedience or this week just simple doubt. And you can play all coy all you want to with me, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that every one of us at some time or another battle the doubt demon. We battle with it. It's a struggle to hold on when it seems like everything is crashing against you. Peter proved that. He's on the water walking across and all of a sudden he got a little wet. And it's hard to hold on when the water's coming over your shoes. But what Jesus was saying is, hey, wait a minute. If you keep your eyes on me, it doesn't matter how much water comes against your shoes. I will get you over every wave. But you've got to learn how to stand. So that's our call today. I want you to start examining yourself right now. Because it's so easy to start looking up to heaven and saying, God, you're not listening. Or it's so easy to look up to heaven and say, God, 
you don't care or, or God, you've left me or, or all the other things that we want to throw up God's way. But now it's time to do the right thing and look inward and say, okay, Lord, do I have some doubt in my life? Have I not been trusting you like I should? Have I been praying? James said it's a double-minded person. You say one thing and do another, or you pray without believing. Do you really think you'll get your prayers answered if you keep praying about something but not really trusting it will happen? You're wasting your time, basically, is what he was saying. So let's examine ourselves. As the praise team comes back to join me,